Jesus took some of the axiomatic statements, standard of the world, turned it upside down and presented it as a series of pronouncements or pronouncements or blessings we call Beatitudes. And we heard last week him saying, blessed are the poor in spirit. And I used the word, actually I got so many emails. Uh, <laughs> uh, it was my mistake. I should have explained what that word meant. I kept saying ebian, ebian. And so you, what in the world is that? I should have shown you, um, actually. I hope I have a slide there. Uh, it comes from a Hebrew word, uh, ebionim, uh, which is actually a group of for the lack of better words, or a good analogy will be the spiritual skid row of Palestine, where uh, a lot of poor people isolated from the society lived, and they called themselves Ebion, or Ebionim is the community of poor, or pauper, or destitutes, whichever way you want to translate. And uh, they became a spiritual community, and some people say John the Baptist was part of that, but eventually it became a Christian sect. And now there are, again, controversies. You know, this is not a university lecture, but if you are interested, there is confusion about, is it, they are called Ebionites. Is it because somebody named Ebion, now that's another guy, E-B-I-O-N, -E uh, started this sect, or is it because it is actually, and it's commonly accepted that it comes from this community of the destitutes, poor in spirit, Ebionim, uh, that, you know, so, so that's a context in which Jesus was speaking. Obviously, the Beatitudes are not recorded in Hebrew, so that's not exactly what Jesus said, but that's the context in which the poverty in spirit, what, how do we understand uh, what we mean by poor in spirit? And we saw that last week, it is not easy to become poor, <laughs> according to the biblical, biblical standard. You have to go through three-step process. First step is that you have to lose everything. And the second step, because you lost everything, you will be rejected by the world. That's where the isolation uh, come, come, come to place, loneliness. And the third step is, because you lost everything, because you are rejected by everyone, you look at God as your only source of health. Only source of help. Only at that point, we become part of a beyond Only then, we become spiritually poor. A complete detachment from the world, you know, per se, but then attached to God as our only source of help. So we have to have a self-reflection of, are we really poor in spirit? It's, 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 a, it's a critical reflection on ourselves in, in the society we live in, right? So anyway, that was what we talked about last week. So today, we are going to go to the next beatitude, the second beatitude. Uh, would you stand with me for the reading of the word? Uh, this again is only one verse, so we can do it together. Um, is it on the screen yet? Okay. Yes. Blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. <laughs> One of the coolest thing about being a senior pastor is that, you know, you can assign certain things you don't really want to do from a church ritualistic perspective to other pastors. <laughs> you know, um, for example, I'm not a big fan of doing weddings. I, I, have, I, I only do weddings if the couple are very, very, very close to me. Uh, and not necessarily because I have anything against weddings, because you know, in, normally in a, any wedding ceremony, uh, the, the pastor or the priest is more like a prop. Uh, you know, it's, it's just a fun and fascinating, you know, all the stuff, and yeah, Reverend, just kiss the bride and so that we can celebrate. It doesn't really matter what you say, you know, in some way. Uh, but <laughs> because, you know, people are in the mood, you know, I'm, 
you know, I have done a, a few weddings, and by the way, I have a 100% track record, and they are still married, so that's another important thing, and I want to make sure that they still, they're still married. But anyway, um, but as morbid as it sounds, I love doing funerals. I love doing funerals. I love going and speaking at memorials. And this January, you know, actually I was not even a senior pastor, I was the missional outreach pastor, and I did two funerals. I was way out of my job portfolio. A missional outreach pastor is not supposed to be funeral, but I wanted to do it, and they asked me to do it, and I, it was such an, such an honorable time for me, because when you go to a funeral, people are mourning, and they are listening to every single word that comes out of the pastor's mouth. And they are so sensitive. Every word you speak counts and has such a big impact. And then you also become enriched being part of the family's life and being in this journey. Uh, and and I, I think it's a I always consider it a blessing to be part of a memorial or a funeral. And actually, I have a mentor who is a pastor in Ohio, uh, and he has been, a, he's a third generation senior pastor. And he would always say to me, Matthew, I have done, I think last time he talked to me, I have done 837 funerals. And he says that with so much pride. <laughs> I've never heard a senior pastor saying that, uh, you know, because they always want to avoid that part, right? You know, your funeral, you know, Bill Mead or Roger Bosch or whoever, right? You know, that, but anyway, the reason I'm saying this, Ecclesiastes, the wisest of the wisest, Solomon said this, 7-2, it is better to be in a house of mourning than in a house of feasting. It is better to go to a house of mourning than being in a house of feasting. Now, don't hear me wrong, and I don't think there is anything inherently Christian about mourning. There is anything inherently blessed about our tears, and God is not some kind of uh, masochist who enjoys our pain. And this, again, this is a reality. Like we talked about blessed are the poor last week, and I said there is a prosperity gospel, and there is also a poverty gospel, you know, which says we should always be poor. No, that's not what it means. In the same way, when Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn, he didn't mean that we keep mourning all the time. We keep crying all the time. Because there is certain Christian sects, uh, sects which believes in this self-flagellation and inflicting pain on themselves because they believe that by our pain, God is somehow glorified. You know, that's an extreme uh, way of thinking. So don't take this out of context. But Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn. And I, again, don't think there is inherently anything good about suffering or mourning. But there are certain kinds of mourning or certain kinds of tears, I would say, that we shed can have a significant impact in our spiritual life and it glorifies God and it kind of shapes the trajectory of our spiritual life. And I'm going to talk about, talk about three kinds of tears that we shed that would be pleasing to God, okay? One, I would call Tears of repentance. Tears of repentance. See, Christianity begins with the self-confrontation. I'll say that one more time. Very important. Christianity begins with the self-confrontation. It is like the Holy Spirit holds a mirror against your wretched, selfish heart and convict you of the deepest, darkest sins that you hold inside. Now you look at the mirror and you confront yourself. Now that's a difficult kind of confrontation. And you say, oh, what a wretched, 
sinner I am. And then you shed a tear. That's where Christianity begins. That is exactly where Christianity begins. Now I read the story of the publican and the Pharisee last week. And you remember that publican or the tax collector, the first word that came out of his mouth, this is what he said, Luke chapter 18, 13. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. He was beating his breast. He was crying out loud, shedding tears of repentance and said, merciful to me, I am a sinner. Now that's where it begins. Now it's not just the publican. Even the prophets did that in Isaiah chapter 6. You have this majestic vision of God revealing himself to the prophet, prophet Isaiah. You know what the first thing came out of his mouth? Prophet Isaiah, he has an MD degree or, you know, he is a holy man. He is a prophet chosen by God. This is what the prophet said, Isaiah chapter 6 verse 5. Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips. Prophet. <laughs> He's not some drunkard from the street. He's a prophet who speaks holy words of the Lord. He says, I am a man of unclean lips. See, this is what happens when God holds a mirror against you. And you see yourself for the first time, the way God sees you, the moment you see it, that's a self-confrontation where you shed tears of repentance. And only then, only then, Christianity begins. The saddest thing I see in many churches is that we become Christians by osmosis. By mean that we live in a Christian country. We know Christians are generally good people even though we try to blame them on social media on, for everything. But generally people know Christians are good people. They come to church and they see what we do and they get involved because we do a lot of soup kitchens and you know community service. And then we do social activism and these are all we should do, we should continue to do. But then they go, oh, this is good. You know, I, I want to be part of it. And they become, they start tithing, they start to take membership, and, you know, they go through the, the motions, and they eventually become members, so they go become good Christians. I'm not saying that there is anything wrong with that. But the church almost always shy away from using that sin word. In India, a famous guru, Hindu guru, named Swami Vivekananda said, it is a sin to call men sinners. It is a sin to call men sinners. That's okay because it's a Hindu fundamental ideology and that's the way their philosophical structure is set up and I won't blame him for saying that. But unfortunately, some Christian pastors are saying that right now in the Western world. We don't talk about sin. That's a bad word. That doesn't give Christianity a good rapper. No, but these are fundamentals. Maybe we are a church of 125 years old, but have we begun Christianity? That's why I said Christianity begins with a self-confrontation, with a deep conviction of sin. And looking at the cross and saying that, Lord, I am a wretched, miserable sinner. Have mercy on me. And then, and only then, Christianity begins. So that's the tears of repentance. And then the next one I would call tears of trial. Trial, you know. We all go through trials, right? You know, one of the most beautiful passages in the whole Bible, if, you, if I ask you, pretty much everybody will say, Psalms 23, 
right? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, right? Like, you know, the Lord is my shepherd, the good shepherd, Sam. But there is a verse that st- sticks out like a sore thumb in that, in that, in that, uh, in that uh, Sam. This is what it says. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Even though I, va- I walk through the valley of the sh- What? I thought good shepherd is leading me. I thought the good shepherd knows the way. <laughs> and he will make my path in such a way that I will have no one. I will never thirst. That's what I thought. But at the same Sam is the caveat. Even though sometime the good shepherd will lead you through the valley of the shadow of death. Reason being, in the New Testament is very clearly explained. Jesus said, my sheep, oh, this is John 10, 27. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. He did not say, my sheep my sheep look at me, they see me and follow me, they hear my voice because I won't be there with them all the time. So I have to tune their, uh, you know, the frequency in such a way that my sheep can hear me. They will not see me. They may not have a tangible manifestation of who God is in their life, but even in the clamor of the world, they will be able to recognize the voice of the shepherd. Now, that makes sense in Psalm 23 because the good shepherd has to take you through the valley of the shadow. That is darkness. You can't see the shepherd in the valley of the shadow. It is dark. All you can feel is your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The rod and the staff of a shepherd, if you see, it's not fun to be prodded by that rod and the staff. It is poking on you. It is dark in the valley of the shadow. It is dark. I can't see the shepherd. I can't see anything. I am, it's so dark. But then I hear this, I get this prodding but the staff and the road so that, oh, oh, okay, this is the way I should go. Okay, I can see it. This is the way I should go. But I can hear the voice of the master. I can hear the voice of the good shepherd. And in that valley of the shadow of death, in the darkness, that sheep will be trained to hear the voice of the master, the voice of the shepherd, and recognize that voice from all other tempting voices in the culture. And unless and until we go through the valley of the shadow of the death, we will never be able to hear the voice of the shepherd and, and recognize him and follow him. Robert Browning, one of the four fam- most famous poets of all, and he wrote a poem, and this is what it says, Walking with Sorrow. I walked a mile with pleasure, She chatted all the way, but left me none the wiser for all she had to say. I walked a mile with sorrow, and never a word said she. But oh, the things I learned from her (laughs) when sorrow walked with me. That is the difference between walking with sorrow and walking with pleasure. That is the nature of the fallen world and in which the shepherd has to train our eardrums in such a way that we can recognize his voice even in the valley of the shadow of death. And we can isolate his voice from the clamor of the world that is vying for your attention every single moment. And that's why I said in the first class, Jesus is inviting us to climb the mountain of suffering with him. 
mountain of suffering is the mountain of discipleship. It is in that crucible of pain that you identify with the Savior the most. That is, such is the nature of the kingdom of God. The third and the last kind of tears I wanted to mention is the tears for the world or tears for others, I would say. See, I talked about going to funeral and memorial. <laughs> you know, Jesus went to many funerals, actually, uh, and one of them in particular stands out in John chapter 11, right? Not only that he went to the funeral, he actually cried at the funeral. Sometimes, really, Jesus? <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm talking about, right? You know the shortest verse in the Bible is John chapter 11:35, right? You know that from Sunday school. That's all it says. Jesus wept. Really? <laughs> I don't think of our leaders as somebody who weeps in public. But Jesus wept. That is one verse. One verse. John 11.35, the, short, the, small, the shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept at this funeral. And I wonder why? <laughs> because what happens right after is that he is resurrecting this person. <laughs> So why did, he, why did he cry? Because he, he knew that he's going, to, he's going to resurrect this person. Oh, I want you to, this is not the time to preach the sermon. I will do it another time. I want you to go home and read John chapter 11. It almost runs like a movie. But Jesus had this absolutely amazing relationship with these two sisters. Martha and Mary. Her brother, their brother is the one who died. He is not very important. But Martha and Mary are very... <laughs> no, seriously, that's the way the narrative goes, at least, you know, my perception. Uh, but Martha and Mary are so close to Jesus, right? And, and, and so he gets the word that Lazarus is sick, okay? John chapter 11 starts by Jesus getting the news that Lazarus is sick. And then it says, Jesus said, oh, this is not for death. This is for glorifying God's name. Okay? He said that. And then you know what Jesus does? He stays there for two more days. Is that what good friends do? You go to Jesus. Jesus, my brother is dying. And Jesus said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't worry. I had to preach. I have two more days to, left here. He is still speaking there. He doesn't have to go to heal him. And we know he has remotely healed many people who can say, okay, Lazarus, be healed and continue the sermon, right? No, he, he stayed there for two more days. And the third day, he says, you go home and read it. Third day, he says, now our brother Lazarus is sleeping, which means he is dead. So third day, he, he, he died. Now, when he goes to his tomb, and it says that Lazarus has been, uh, you know, uh, in the tomb for four days. So three plus four more days. So it is the seventh day that Jesus is reaching to his best friend's brother. And all along, because John chapter 11 gives us the premise saying that this is to glorify God's name. This is to glorify his name. Jesus is doing intentionally so that the, you know, because Jesus has resurrected many people from their deathbed. But he has not resurrected anybody who is, who is dead for four days. The body is almost decaying. So Jesus is saying that I am going to do a very powerful miracle here and I am I'm going to make this delay very intentional because I'm going to glorify God's name here, but Mary and Martha are part of the equation because he knew that the, he could count on Mary and Martha suffering this pain for seven days. And when he goes there and he talks to Martha, it's very interesting, talks to Martha, he talks about, oh, you know, I am the resurrection and the life and all this theological conversation. And Mary is inside the house. She is upset. She is upset. Martha is the one who comes and talks. And Mary is close to Jesus. You can read Luke chapter 10, 46, all of that. You know, because Mary always sat close to Jesus. Right? And then towards the end, Mary comes out. And Mary says that, Oh, if, if you were here, my brother wouldn't have died. And that verse says, 
Jesus looked at her. He was deeply troubled, depending on your translation. And he was moved in the spirit when he looked at Mary. Mary, I needed you for this miracle. I needed to put you through this pain for this miracle. But when I see your tears, Mary, I feel bad that I had to do it. I feel bad that you had to go through this. And I am glad that you brought glory to God's name, but you had to go through this pain. And I believe the tears in Jesus' eyes were the tears of Mary. It was not Jesus' tears. He knew he was going to resurrect like, like this, resurrect Lazarus like that. But when he looked at Mary and her tears, he was deeply troubled and moved in spirit. There are two adjectives put in there. And Jesus had an emotional <laughs> breakdown, if I can say, because he looked at Mary. So I want you to know that when you go through your trials, when you go through your trials, when you go through your tears, and God is going to use that to bring glory to his name. But each time you go through it, I want you to know that there is a God who himself suffered only in Christianity. Only in Christianity. No other God understands tears. There is only one God who ever cried. Gods don't cry. Jesus did. He felt your pain. And the tears in Jesus' eyes were the tears of Mary. Now Jesus wants us to have the same tears for others. I know we all cry. How many of us cry for other people? How many of us feel the pain of other people? There is one more instance where Jesus cried. Jesus wept. Luke chapter 13, sorry. Luke chapter 17, I believe. Sorry, my eyes. Uh, 19, 41 to 42. <laughs> when he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, if you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, Oh, Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem, I weep over you. If you had known what would bring you peace. How many of us cried over Pasadena? How many of us cried for America? Yeah, you can talk about ideologies and go to your social media wall and pretend that you bring peace and justice. How many of us actually literally cried? That's what I'm asking. Literally cried. Jesus wept over the city and cried over the city. If only you had known. D.L. Moody once said, once said, Every time I pass a drunkard, drunkard on the street, I feel personally responsible for him. <laughs> D.L. Moody felt personally responsible for every drunkard on the street because his heart broke for what breaks God's heart. God of the Bible has a broken heart. Did you know that? God of the Bible has a broken heart and he weeps over you and he weeps over what you have over this city and as Christians, can we shed the tears for others? Can we mourn with those who mourn? That's my question. I'm going to close here. You know, last week I did an altar call I didn't plan it, and I just did it. I don't know, just sometime it come, things come to me. Um, but I, this day, I want to do an altar call for the church, okay? I don't want you to get up or raise your hand in your, in, your, in your mind. 
This is an altar call for the church. You remember last week I read a verse about the last church in the book of Revelation, which in so many ways exemplifies the, uh, the contemporary church uh, today, uh, which is the church of Laodicea, the seventh and the final church. And I read, these are, this is what Jesus says to the church of Laodicea. Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy, and have need of nothing. And you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. That was the condemnation, the conviction from the Holy Spirit to us. But that didn't end there. Then Jesus gave an altar call. Jesus literally gave an altar call to the church of Laodicea. This is what he said. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. And as a preacher, I always, almost always use it as an altar call verse, you know, to invite people to Christ. But the more I read it, the more I realize it was not just meant for individual, it was meant for a church. It was meant for a community. And Jesus looks at Lake Avenue Church and the church in America and the church of the world and says that you think you are rich and you think you're wealthy, realize you're, you're wretched, you're miserable, you're poor. Self-confrontation. Self-confrontation. Look at yourself. But I'm not here to condemn you. I'm here to give you peace. Would you come to me? Would you come to me? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. We have been lamenting over many things in the culture. We have been lamenting on different things in the culture. Now, now I want us to take that lamenting, the tears of lamenting to the next stage, which is the tears of repentance. Lamenting is not good enough. It is a good start. It's not good enough. Repent. I know the pastors don't say that kind of words. It's very harsh. But that's how Jesus began his ministry. Mark, read the gospel of Mark, the first word. Jesus, repent. The kingdom of God is here. Not just lament. No, that's not good enough. Repent. Turn around. Turn around. Because he's standing at the door and he's knocking. Let's pray. I'm going to invite our young adult quartet to come and give us a great uh, musical response after this. Let's pray. Hmm. Lord, we repent. There are so many things that we hold as truth. Because of our intellectual knowledge, we read the Bible, we study the Bible, we understand the Bible. Um, but at this point, Lord, we look at the cross and realize how wretched and how miserable we are and we have become in our own understanding. Whether clergy or laity, pastor, or you know, whether it's pulpit or the pew, Lord, even the publican and the prophet had to cry out, I am a man of unclean lips. Lord, that's where we are. We pray that you will come into our life. And we are mourning. We are mourning. We are shedding the tears of repentance. We are shedding the tears of trial. But we are shedding the tears for the world because we want to identify with your broken heart. We know that you are the one. The God with the tears is the one who is comforting us. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen.